This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Winter Haven, Florida, October 13th, 2013. Before I lead us in prayer, I'd like to extend an invitation to, and tell you why I'm praying. As most of you know, I sort of go from church to church every single Sunday. And since Joe Toma, who is here to videotape the sermon and post it on the website, does this pretty much everywhere I go, that means I don't give the same sermon every Sunday. <laughs> I've heard some do that, but I don't. But instead, what I do, and this is what I'm asking you to pray with me about, is that I believe with all my heart that God has something that He wishes to say to each congregation. It's unique. And so what I would like to ask you to do is if you would join me in prayer and ask that God, through liturgy, word, sacrament, and sermon, and song, would use those things to speak something very specifically to us. I certainly have prepared things to say, but I also want to really be open that if God has something that He would like to do or say, that's what I want to do. So let us pray together. Lord, I thank you for the enormous privilege of gathering together in the name of your Son and that because of what He has done in forgiveness, mercy, death, resurrection, we are invited to come into your presence and know because of His mercy and His forgiveness that we are welcome to bear. So draw us near to you. Open our hearts and our minds to you. Work in us that which you desire. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to us during this time that we have together. O oh, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We give ourselves to you, and we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. If I were to give a title to what I want to say today, it would be moving from the outside to being brought in. Moving from the outside to being brought in. Because it seems to me that's the, that's the way that the scriptures are describing what's happening today. And so we have to start from the outside. And so the question is asked, have you ever felt like you were on the outside? That you were in a way and not that many people knew you or perhaps were even interested in talking to you. Or have you been in that awful position where because of things that have happened in your life, you enter into a room and there's a part of you that you want to intentionally keep hidden. And you learn to, sorry, my mic's low. So you learn how to compensate for that. You know how to introduce yourself. You know how to put a smile on your face. But there is a part of you that says, if they knew everything about who I was, maybe they actually wouldn't want to meet me after all. <laughs> and because that's the case, even though you may be around a group of people and you're laughing and talking with people, you feel a little bit on the outside because of what's inside. The point of the gospel story of Jesus and the lepers is to show what Jesus does with people who feel on the outside. No one felt on the outside more than people who were lepers. They were considered ritually unclean. They were considered cursed by God. They were considered people who needed to be kept sequestered over here lest they either ritually or medically contaminate the other people. And therefore, when the, when the symptoms of leprosy appeared upon them, they were immediately shuttled over to a separate community. Those of you who are older remember the stories about leper colonies. Well, that's what's happening right here. Which means when Jesus is with his disciples, these lepers are standing at a very safe distance. In fact, the law required that you be at least 50 
yards away from any other human being. Talk about a visible separation. Now you also need to know that Jesus, as it says here, is going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. In other words, particularly if you're a disciple and you're trying to keep the law, you're trying to be a good Jew, you're already in a sort of foreign country. You're a little bit nervous about what might be happening to you. You're following Jesus. Okay, I'm with you, Jesus, but this is, this is not home. This is not where, in fact, I even ought to be. I need to be with others who keep the law just like I do because the last thing I want to do is become in some ways or inadvertently ritually unclean myself. So I have this picture in my brain that as the story begins, Jesus is out front. He's confident. He's at home. His father made the whole world. There's no place where in fact he doesn't belong. But his disciples behind him are like, okay, here we go. I hope we get through this okay. And they're walking through. And then of course, they turn a corner perhaps and there is this gathering of ten lepers. Now the astonishing thing about what's going on with these lepers is that they know who Jesus is. His reputation has preceded him. And they understand that Jesus, in fact, has the power to physically cure them of their diseases. And so they shout out because they are at the distance. Jesus, Master, they call him. In other words, we know that you know what to do with us, if you will, because you are master over disease. Jesus, master, have mercy. Mercy meaning, I know I don't deserve this, because you see, if I'm ritually unclean, that means I've been cursed by God. Something must have happened in my life to cause this to happen to me. I'm paying for my sins. And so they're not saying, I deserve to be healed. We might say that. They would never say that. They have the sense instead that they have this disease because they did something. Or there's something in their family lineage. You know, the sins of the father being passed down to the children to the third and fourth generations. So now it's all showing up. And it's all right there. Their guilt, in other words, is literally being born on their skin for others to see. And so they're not asking for justice. Because justice would mean they're getting what they deserve. Instead, they're crying out for mercy, for absolute undeserved attention. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, they are crying. And guess what Jesus does? When Jesus saw them, he said to them, I'll do this. Do you notice what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't say, okay, let's sit down and talk a minute to, for me to figure out whether or not you are actually deserving of this gesture or not. Let's look at the inside of what's really going on with you to determine whether or not you in fact ought to have be someone who is the recipient of mercy. You see, Jesus, Jesus doesn't operate that way. Like there's this wonderful line in 1 John where the writer of 1 John says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you notice again, there are no qualifiers. In other words, it's not a question of, okay, I'm going to forgive you, but you better watch out next time. You see, as I often say, there is nothing about Jesus that sort of is like Santa Claus in the sky. You know, making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. Nobody gets bags of cold when they come to Jesus. Instead, there is something about Jesus that loves people with such passion. And not just passion, understanding. He knows all of who we are. We don't have to hide anything from him. And just like in the story, if we cry out to him for mercy, he's quick to bring it and to give it. So what is he saying? It's, it's almost matter of fact. Okay, go show yourself to a priest. Why does he say that? Because if you're ritually unclean, and if something happens, in fact, to cure you, you have to have that cure certified. 
Because it is the priest who will say to the rest of the community, I have examined this person, and in fact, this person is now clean. Therefore, receive him back into the community. If they did, did not have that kind of, in essence, certificate of acceptance from the priest, even if they were completely physically pure, they still could not be let back in. The priest was the gatekeeper. And so what Jesus wants to do is not merely heal them of a physical symptom. He wants them to be incorporated back into the community from which they came. He wants them to go back home. And so what do they do? They all take off. It's, it's interesting. Not one of them stops and says, how am I supposed to go to a priest when I still have lepers? They literally turn and begin to move as an act of sheer faith that what Jesus says is in fact going to happen. And they turn, and as they turn and make their way, guess what? They're healed. Complete. But then there's one, thank God for the one, who... In looking at himself, realizes that all of his symptoms are gone. His life has just been dramatically changed. And what does he do? When he saw that he was healed, he turned back. He's going back to Jesus, you see, praising God with a loud voice. There's absolutely nothing about him that is going to fit into any sense of decorum. If he came into St. Paul's this morning and he was completely physically healed, we would be, many of us at least, probably very embarrassed if he started praising God with a loud voice. This man doesn't care about that in the slightest. He turns and he goes right to Jesus. And what does he do? He prostrates himself at Jesus' feet. What does that mean? He literally gets on his knees and puts his forehead to the ground. He knows, you see. That's an act of obesity. He knows that something has happened to him that only God could accomplish. He's not just some traveling rabbi. There is more here than that. And Jesus, of course, is thrilled that the man came forward, but of course his first comment is, I thought ten were here. You see, it was his expectation and perhaps even his hope that what they would experience is not just merely the cessation of a physical symptom, but that in fact something would happen that would actually change their heart. And so what does he say to the one who came back? He said, get up and go on your way. And he now says something that something bigger has happened to you than physical healing. Your faith has made you well. Describing at this point something that's bigger than physical symptom cessation, but literally a change of heart. In other words, the man coming back, getting on his face to thank Jesus, says, is the acknowledgement that you are more than a mere mortal, and I yield all of my gratitude to you. His heart has been changed. He has been made well. Not just physically better. The point of the story for us, of course, is what Jesus really wants of us is not just sort of being the answer man in the sky, sort of the spiritual vending machine where I put in, you know, my 50 cents or my dollar 25 for my can of Coke and I go on my way. Instead, what he wants from us and with us is a relationship that knows him that recognizes Him as the Lord of the universe, who is willing to thank Him with tremendous gratitude that of all the good things that I received, Lord, they come from Your hand, and do I deserve them? No, not one. But I am so profoundly grateful. How do I respond? I give my life to You. I give my life to You. In essence, that's exactly what is being ritualized and acted out in the service of confirmation. Where people come and by the words of their promises, as well as the commitments they are making, what, are they, what they are saying is, Jesus, I owe all of who I am to you. I give my life to you. 
And the hope is, is that in yielding and giving, there would be that change of heart, that sense of, I've been received by God. I'm His. He, he will never let me go. He has given me all that I will need in the future, not just in the present. I can trust Him each step of the way. You see, if you work backward from the Gospel, that takes us right into the Epistle, where Paul, even though he is in chains, is willing to acknowledge that God will be the one who will take care of me even to the very end. I'm his. And so even from a jail cell, he exhorts his readers, do, you, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him. Because in fact you have been. If he receives you, he calls you as his child. He loves you. He has forgiven you. You have, in fact, been approved by him. You're not standing at a distance. You've been received, just like the Samaritan who was healed of his leprosy and literally had his heart changed. That's the invitation today. Do you know that about yourself and God? That he is, in fact, received you as his own, and that you don't deserve any of it. All of us are broken sinners. But in fact, God, in his glory, has chosen to look at you and say, come, you belong to me. And in offering that invitation, you, like the Samaritan, turn to him and yield to him all of who you are in sheer gratitude that in the midst of all of the many, I mean, I wanted you to know that there are times in my life when as someone who belongs to Christ, I say, how did I get in on this? This is just too wonderful for words. I'm yours. You love me. I have a place in the world that you have created just for me. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. My sins, are all that they are, are forgiven. And then no matter what happens in the future, even, not just if I stumble and fall, when, because we all do, don't we? Not your head. <laughs> even when I stumble and fall, I know that God, when I say, just like the Samaritan, God have mercy on me, forgive me, He will. I don't ever have to worry about God at any point ever saying to me, oh, that was pretty awful. I'll have to think about forgiveness this time. He doesn't do that. Why? Because I'm His. And He will not reject me as His child because I am His. I belong to Him. And that He will, in fact, hold me in the palm of His hand. He will guide me through even the worst of circumstances. And it does get difficult. Remember, Paul is writing from a jail cell. There's nothing in the Scripture that would indicate that if I give my life to Jesus, that automatically means all of my circumstances are just going to be wonderful. In fact, as I told those preparing for the service this morning, Jesus says exactly the opposite. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. That's a promise. That means it's going to get difficult. It could be really awful, in fact. But he goes on to say, don't be afraid. I've overcome the world. So that literally, no matter whatever you go through, you can count on the companionship of His presence. The sense that even if it gets terrible, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that He will, in His companionship, guide you safely through the very worst that life could bring your way and receive you as His own. Do you know that? Do you know that you are his? That he will never let you go? And that he will guide you through the worst of circumstances? That he will shed, shield you? He will heal your heart of all of the wounds that you have ever received? And that no matter how deep the places are inside, where you have felt like the outsider, he will come and bring his mercy and heal the brokenness of your own heart Remove the sting of condemnation. Wipe the slate clean and 
pour into you is joy. The peace that passes all understanding. That sense of, I belong to him. He will never let me go. I'm his child. God has a purpose for my life. I'm committed to serving him no matter what. That's the inheritance of those who belong to Jesus. And only Jesus can do it. There is no other way for the sin and the brokenness inside of us to be healed. Because only God can forgive sin. We have a phrase in our culture that to me is paltry at best. We don't talk about forgiveness or healing. We just say, we've moved on. <laughs> that's not bad if that's the best you can do. I'd rather people be to move on than to be stuck. But there is so much more. No matter whatever pain or difficulty you've gone through, it's not just moving on. It's being healed. It's being forgiven. It's the slate being wiped clean. Do you deserve it? No. None of us do. Because none of us are totally clean in this life, right? Yes. But he gives it because he loves us. So as we go through the service, I would invite you to open up those places in your heart where Jesus needs to come and touch and heal and restore, where you need him to come and do what no other human being can do. And as we see these who come for confirmation, say yes to Christ, inside your heart say, yes, Lord, I yield to you too. And as you come for communion and extend your hands, you're not just coming to receive, it's, you're saying, here I am, God. I give all of who I am to you including the places in my life where I'm the most broken, where I'm the most afraid, where I feel the deepest sense of shame and condemnation. Come and heal. Believe me. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, I will never turn that one away. So come today. Come and be a part of the wonder of what God can do in, in your life. Because He, He, can do something that no one else can do. Forgive, heal, and restore. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, in the midst of this congregation this morning, I know that there are those who have felt on the outside. Sometimes because of things that they have done. Sometimes because of things that have been done to them. And, O oh Lord, wherever they are, wherever they've been, whatever they've done, I pray, pray that you would give them the courage to cry out to you, to offer those deep and broken places to you, that you might heal, that you might bring peace, forgiveness, and mercy. For you are the healer of broken hearts. And you are the one who receives us with great joy and the promise that nothing can take you out of my hand. So we thank you, O oh Lord. We yield to you, and we praise you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.